when when we talk about power people don't know what it means hmm. so power has a very clear and simple definition from my perspective power is the ability to command and control india is right now not a match for china if we did not have nuclear weapons china would very much want to fragment india and do whatever it takes some of these people are actually like agents of the chinese government to understand how the us works how the society works they've been embedded there deliberately and been given tons of cash some of them have been accused and actually apprehended uh because they have been uh, you know stealing technology and transmitting that to to back to the mainland motherland the business people have have taken over lots of real estate and stuff like that so there's a there's a concerted effort by the chinese to to infiltrate various nations i mean he has the means the ability to to flatten ukraine in two days time he has the firepower the 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 you know the air force all of that छोटी सी अनाउंसमेंट सारे देश के एस्पायरिंग पॉडकास्टर्स के लिए हमारा टूल प्रो पॉडकास्टर टूल्स इज आउट नाउ एनी वेयर फ्रॉम प्रोडक्शन आउटरीच रिसर्च डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन वायरलिटी ग्रोथ पोस्ट प्रोडक्शन सब सिखाया जा रहा है फॉर अ फ्रैक्शन ऑफ द प्राइस दर यू पे एन एजेंसी एनी वेयर फ्रॉम स्टार्टिंग टू स्केलिंग अ पॉडकास्ट एंड मीटिंग वी आई पीज अक्रॉस द कंट्री इज अवेलेबल नाउ प्रो पॉडकास्ट टूल्स लेकिन डिस्क्रिप्शन लेट मी नो एंड आल सी यू टू स्टार्ट योर पॉडकास्टिंग जर्नी टूडे योर इज अ माई फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू नदर ऑफ दोस्त का मेरा नाम है विनम्र कसाना आई एम नॉट गो टेक 10 seconds more and just say this is an episode with abhijit chawla we discuss everything from the russia ukraine war we discussed india's status as a civilization state we talked about everything that you know about geopolitics concise in a 1.5 hour episode enjoy the episode with abhijit chawla because in 3 2 1 welcome to the cooped up life of a podcaster abhijit thank you so much for having me how's it going good um i had the chance of hanging out with you a bunch in mangalore yeah. you and kushal having many many coffees many many great breakfasts and a great panel at mangalore lit fest yep and ever since i've come to know you i figured your uh, walking encyclopedia of geopolitics the physicist part is covered often but not as often as geopolitics people across the world throng to you for your geopolitical expertise um i want to start with perhaps our neighbor mm-hmm. right pakistan only because a friend of mine called me tereko pata hai imran khan ko jail hone wali hai acha um and then as of today he is already jailed he so is. i figured we would st- start with <clears throat> imran khan his role in pakistan as this sort of uh, renegade pm figure um and subsequent rise fall and uh, the state of uh, instability that pakistan has had now for in since its inception mm-hmm. but particularly let's talk about imran khan we know that he's a cricketer right how was he able to change pakistan's politics and why do people still love him despite not having too much to say or prove from a geopolitical or a diplomatic standpoint so imran khan is this great cricketer one of the all time greats he was uh, probably pakistan's best ever cricket captain he was able to bring these this bunch of people cricketers from different backgrounds together and mold them into a fighting unit and his last act was winning the world cup 1992 world cup mm. so the people of pakistan lo- pakistan love him and, and admire him a lot for that uh, so he clearly has the leadership qualities uh, the qualities that you need in, in a leader to be able to bring people together for a common cause common vision and and you know uh, take them forward and and win so he has that and he obviously we know that he always had these political ambitions so mm-hmm. as soon as he retired he started working on building a cancer hospital in the memory of his mother mm-hmm. and he succeeded in doing that and eventually yeah he stepped into politics and his plank his entire platform was was anti imperialism i remember him saying a long time ago on some bbc or something interview that uh, he did not want any aid money from the us any support from the us it's poisoned money that's what he said mm. right and he eventually d- did become the prime minister and he took pakistan in a, into the arms of china so at that time uh, the americans had kind of uh, you know kind of lost interest in pakistan for for some time and pa- and, and china was making inroads with the china pakistan economic corridor cpec and so on so imran khan tried his best to woo china and and you know bring the two nations closer and uh, there was talk about the two nations being the iron brothers and all that uh, but we have to understand one thing about pakistan then that one thing is that the the power center is never where it seems to be see in every nation especially in democracies there are extra electoral extra governmental centers and networks of power yeah. that that you will see even in democracies and pakistan is not a democracy pakistan yeah, yeah. You, you've said in your i i actually was about to purchase a course where i was looking at some of the things you said uh-huh. you said that pakistan is a vassal state of the us yes so how is yeah 
So what's a vassal state? I mean, I use the French pronunciation vassal. Okay, vassal, what's okay, a vassal okay. state? It's it's a it's a satellite state. It's a state that has lost sovereignty to a much more powerful nation, and it it is allowed to keep on governing itself, but certain policies, etc., are strongly mediated, influenced by the more powerful nation. So, for example, Pakistan. Why was Pakistan created in the first place? It was created as a counterbalance to India and to serve certain geopolitical interests, long-term interests of the UK, of, of the British. Mm. Now, the British, they eventually became a second-rate power after, essentially, after 1956, the Suez Crisis, and the US became the dominant power. The dominant power mm. became the US in 1944-45 itself. But uh, the British Empire's center of power moved from London to Washington, somewhere around this time. Mm. And then Pakistan came into the arms and the embrace of the US. And the US also saw a great amount of utility in Pakistan as a counterbalance to India because India was going to pro-USSR and also to keep the USSR and its uh, its uh, you know tentacles away from the warm waters of the Indian Ocean. Mm. So a lot of interests were at stake over here. And Pakistan and the US had have this, uh, you know, this agreement which was signed in the 1950s, which kind of kind of defines the roadmap of Pakistan being a U.S. tributary or vassal state. Mm. So, uh, Pakistan would offer its its territory to the U.S. to serve American geopolitical uh, interests. In mm -hmm. exchange, the Americans would give Pakistan aid in terms of uh, money, arms, ammunition, and all that. And that played out very well in the 1980s during the Soviet Afga in, uh, invasion of Afghanistan, right. where the U.S. Uh, funded the Mujahideen, which were a proxy force to fight the Soviets. Mm -hmm. And the Soviets were never, uh, were, were never able to cross the Pakistan border from where all this terrorism and all that was coming in. And that's why they eventually had to withdraw from Afghanistan. So Pakistan is a U.S. proxy. Uh, and and it was a Chinese proxy as well. So the thing is that when it comes to Pakistan, the real center of power is the army ISI complex, the mm. army, the generals that run the army and the ISI, which is the intelligence uh, arm of the of the army, you could say, and also certain very powerful people, you know, the old uh, landlords or whatever you want to call them. The, the oligarchs Zamindars. of Pakistan. The, the, the oligarchs, let's say. The Zamindars. Zamindars yeah. and all that. Those powerful yeah. families. So it's it's all intertwined. And that's the real power center. Mm -hmm. And they have this so-called democratic process in which some prime minister comes to power. And no prime minister, if I if I remember correctly, has ever completed his or her term properly, that, that sort of thing. So when it comes to Imran Khan coming to power, he, he was never in power. He was, see, in Pakistan, the person who is officially in power is the scapegoat. <laughs> when things go wrong, and they will, you're going to blame it all on that person. And then... Right. And then get rid of the person, maybe hang him like Zia, like Zia Hulk did to Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, or jail him like Imran Khan is currently in or jail. Assassinate and, like Benazir Bhutto. Or assassinate like Benazir Bhutto. So it, it's 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 a poisoned seed. It's a, it's a it's a seed that doesn't give you any power. It gives you status. Okay, I became the prime minister of Pakistan, mm. but at the end of the day, you're gonna be bumped off, or you're gonna be you know blamed for whatever goes wrong. And things will always go wrong in Pakistan because the nation it's owned by the army. The people have no control over what's happening, and the people are essentially resources expended resources so that's how it is so from my perspective i just don't care who is in power officially in pakistan who's the prime minister i don't know i don't care mm. it doesn't matter the policies never change what really matters is where is the uh, where does the uh, pakistan army's allegiance lie currently mm. so the pakistan army is, is a is a mercenary organization and really the, absolutely 100 the, the armed forces of a country as big and as powerful as pakistan are a mercenary army to other powers in the world absolutely so, for example, 1980s, 1990s, we had the end 2000s, 2010s also, we and, and, and even now, we have Pakistan ter Pakistani terrorism that's operating in Jammu and Kashmir. In mm -hmm. the 90s and 2000s and etc., it was, it was a tremendous amount of terrorism that was flowing into India. All of that was funded and financed by the U.S., all right? There's no question about it. Hmm. There is absolutely no question about it that the U.S. funded and financed Pakistani terrorism in India. For clo for more than two decades. But hasn't it been an ally on, on our faces for many, many years now? So that's how the world works, you know. You're going to work together in some things and you're going to, you know, you're going to stab people in the back as well. Yeah. And and you you keep on piling the pressure so that you can coerce your so-called ally to do certain things. Hmm. That's how it works. So it's at the end of the day, when, when, you, when you take a realistic approach and a realistic view of the world, it's all about power. Every nation has a certain amount of power. So in my course, I call it comprehensive national power. Mm -hmm. And you can actually... 
you can actually co- calculate every nation's CNP, Comprehensive National Power, based on a number of factors. So typically people think about GDP. When you think about how powerful and how big every nation is, you talk about the GDP ranking. So the US is number one, China is number two, Japan, Germany, India, and so on and so forth. Well, GDP is just one factor. There are a whole bunch of other factors that come into consideration. This power projection, that is your um, uh, how strong your army is. Power projection is a, is a very interesting concept and so on and so forth. There's a whole mm-hmm. bunch of factors. So let, let, let's talk about power projection for a sec. Mm-hmm. Um, because I also want to tie that into something else. We often think about India as a soft power, right? But I'm not sure what the definition means. And then I, I was listening to one of your podcasts and you said that the USA is a very openly hard power. Mm-hmm. What's the difference between the two? So hard power is all about, see, okay, what's the definition of power? What do we mean by power? When, when we talk about power, people don't know what it means. Hmm. So power has a very clear and simple definition from my perspective. Others sure. can disagree, I don't care. Hmm. Power is the ability to command and control. That's it. Hmm. Command and control. It's not about pleasing people and influence and what they call soft power, culture, blah, blah, blah. All that is nice to have. Hmm. It is absolutely worthless without hard power, which is the ability to command and control. Think about, let's say you have a nation that is the most beautiful and advanced culture in the world, but they are paupers. They have terrible living standards. The per capita GDP is abysmal. Is anyone going to respect them? Let's Thailand. Whoever. Yeah. Yeah. Let's say you have a person who is very well read, okay, very cultured and all, lots of knowledge, but that person has, is, is jobless mm. and has no money. And is I anyone going to respect that person? That's simply how the world works. A humanities PhD generally. <laughs> <laughs> so there you have it. So the thing is, so that's power. Power is the ability to command and control. And power projection is essentially how far can you command and control beyond your territorial borders. Hmm. That is power projection. So there are there are a number of ways of, of measuring, quantifying a nation's power projection abilities. One is how much of the global economy do you, do you control? Second is how, uh, how many extraterritorial military bases do you have? Hmm. Right? So India, well, I'll, I'm, I'll just put out a, a number. Let's say India has seven extraterritorial military bases beyond Indian territory. It does? Let's say it has seven. Okay. Take a let's say. I don't know exactly how many we have, but I'll, mm. I'll put out oh, a it's number. Like, it's a covert information generally. like Yeah, but I uh, open source, I'll say seven. Yeah. Okay. No, because the US is very open source. Right? Everyone knows that the US has many, many bases across the world. And there's no no lying about that. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so India, let's say, has seven. Uh, mm. seven. Russia, let's say, has 25 mm. beyond its territory. China has four, let's say. Mm. The US has more than 750 extraterritorial military bases on other people's territory. Wow. Well, there you have it. That's power projection. The ability okay. to command and control beyond your territorial boundaries. So when, when Forbes ranks countries top most, I was looking at the rankings today, like okay. top 10 most powerful countries. And I thought Forbes must be reasonable and must have reasonable statistics for measuring that. Uh-huh. When say, they say China is second. It is not. So in this way, China is a meager, <laughs> I mean, it's nothing compared to the US. Yeah, so I have my very, uh, very clear way of, uh, means of, uh, you know, uh, a very clear uh, way of calculating which, where each nation uh, ranks in the power scale. And China is nowhere close to the US. It's not even a match. It's a mismatch. So why do we often label China as right next to Russia and USA? What do we what do we get fundamentally wrong about China then? Well, we look at things from the simple GDP perspective. That's okay. it. Economically. We just Econom- look at economy. Yeah. yeah, there you have it. So China has the second largest economy in the world. The US, I don't know what it is. What's the GDP? 26 trillion. 26 trillion. China has 17 trillion, let's say. Yeah. And Russia is nowhere even close to the US or China. Yeah, it's around 1 point something trillion. Yeah, so it's it's a, it's a US, then it's China, then it's uh, Japan, Germany, India, and France and whatever else. Mm. So people look at the world from the GDP rankings perspective because it's the most simplistic perspective you have and you get those tables everywhere. Yeah. So that's why people think of China as an emerging superpower. Well, I'll tell you, it's nowhere near being a superpower. It is nowhere close to the power projection the US has. The Chinese power projection beyond its territory is similar to the Indian power projection beyond our territory. And France has a better power projection ability than India or France. Maybe both of them combined, perhaps, you know. And France itself is kind of a kind of a quasi quasi vassal of the US. So, But didn't you say in one of your podcasts that the France is actually very antithetical to the US? It does not like uh, the US? It's, it's a very interesting relationship. So France is part of NATO. It's part of the EU. Hmm. And both these organizations are dominated or controlled or essentially owned by the US. So hmm. the EU is, is, is a economic political grouping 
of mm. nations okay it's it's like pooled sovereignty the nations pool their sovereignty together and they lose out on sovereignty because the eu government gets a lot of the sovereignty and the decisions about borders and immigration and what not mm. financial policies all that when it comes to nato it's a military alliance so an attack on one nato member is an attack on all nato members and everybody is obligated to respond okay so that's the kind of a deal you have in nato and both the eu and nato are essentially controlled created whatever you want to call it by the us so that's where the real power lies so france as a member of nato is subsidiary it, it's kind of lower in the hierarchy compared to the us similarly it's part of the eu so it loses out on, on some sovereignty but the thing about france is that they have a quasi independent foreign policy they have their own nuclear deterrent unlike other nations like the uk mm -hmm. okay they have their own nuclear deterrent they have their own nuclear submarines and they have their own nuclear missiles the uk is does not have that same so thing. the uk has aircraft carriers it has submarines it has their doesn't have nukes it has nukes they they make their own nukes the funny the fun fact is that they use polaris missiles okay which are american missiles which tells you that the big red button is in washington not in rishi sunak's uh, front desk interesting yeah. okay that's how it is and in the past they used trident missiles i don't know trident polaris whichever is being used right now yeah yeah so at, at let's talk about rishi sunak because i think he's mm. a fascinating individual he sort of uh came to power without an election was just <laughs> figured his way through many many back offices into 10 downing street um but in on, in your own podcast only you said that rashi sunak is virtually like a puppet is an artificial state just like canada is they're both controlled by the us at what point does the empire start declining and the new roman empire which is also declining now culturally the us start coming up so uh the uk uh, was dealt essentially a death blow in the second world war the uk controlled this vast territory they had this entire global network uh supply chains uh railway lines you know shipping lines all that so they control all the choke points suez canal the uh, strait of hormuz all those things but uh they were dealt a death blow in the second world war where where they became indebted to the us they were able to hold out only because of us assistance continuing us assistance against germany and eventually what happens is that when the second world war is ending in 1944 you have the bretton woods conference in the us mm -hmm. in which the uh, decision was reached that the that the global reserve currency would now would henceforth be the us dollar so that would be the currency that underlies the entire global financial system and the 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 british pound was no longer part of that it earlier the the pound was the main currency so now onwards it would be the us dollar and all the major western nations whether whether it's france whether it's the uk they were under a pile of debt to the us and the us had the means to enforce the debt i mean debt means nothing unless you can enforce the debt right, right? so the the british were repaying the debt until the beginning of the 21st century to the us okay substantial amounts of debt every, repayments every year debt that accrued was accrued in the second world war all the immense amounts of uh, you know material with interest yeah with interest i'm sure <laughs> with interest okay i haven't i haven't looked at the specifics but i'm sure there would be interest yeah. involved in this so that is one aspect of it uh, secondly the the british tried one you know tried one last gasp measure to regain some kind of uh, geopolitical relevance which was in i think 1956 or 58 56 the suez crisis so the british the french and the israelis tried to invade egypt and take over the suez canal and they were kind of succeeding and then the americans step in and say out out you go and the entire invasion is foiled and then that's how egypt kind of comes on the side of the us and that was the end of whatever was left of uh, the uk as a as a geopolitical power but why would these three nations supposedly mm. still comprising the west still go and invade an islamic country that wasn't posing any harm just to acquire an extra territory so it was about the suez canal which is a very vital geopolitical choke point mm -hmm. okay a transit point yeah, yeah, yeah. so if you want us uh, you know otherwise you have to transit through all the way through africa the right the cape of so called good yeah, hope yeah, yeah, all yeah, that yeah. so it's a, it's a, it's a shortcut and uh, egypt obviously controls i mean it owns that i mean it it passes through egypt so what uh, nasser the the leader of egypt did was he nationalized the suez canal which means that he acquired the suez canal which was that, at that time being run by the british i think i think it the british or whoever it was I, most likely the british they owned that that piece of real estate Mm. So he acquired that. He obviously paid them for it, but he took control of that. Mm. And in retaliation, these guys invaded that. That, that, that we want control of this. Mm. So it was it was called the the spinal column of the British Empire or something something like that. It was called at some point in time. Right, because they control all trade. I mean, to to control India, you have to pass through the Suez Canal. Yeah. 
So let's talk about India. Um, yeah. I was in Ladakh about two years ago, uh -huh. and I was staying at this uh, in this river valley camp. This gentleman from the UK ran it, mm -hmm. and he showed me this book called The Great Game by okay. Peter Hopkirk. Uh -huh. I'm sure you've heard of the book, mm -hmm. um, and it talked about how um, for many many years post the World War, all the way till the late 90s uh, or early 2000s, Russia and the UK were playing this dangerous game of trying to get to India via land, mm -hmm. right? And they would send spies who would go on long missions for years on end to figure out um, what's the best way to make it to India via land, right? How is it that India has been protected through all its borders for so many years that the only possible invasions have come either directly through Afghanistan or Pakistan? Um, and, 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 you know, uh, what is it about India's borders specifically that these missions that happened for many, many years failed? So the great game was about, uh, you know, about the control of Central Asia. Because mm. whoever would control Central Asia would determine who reaches India. Mm. So if the Russians could, took con the control of the entirety of Central Asia, up to Afghanistan, let's say, then they could uh, straight away make inroads into India. India was the crown jewel of the British Empire, where all of the wealth, whatever was being extracted, was sustaining the British Empire. Uh, it, it produced more wealth and resources for the British than everything else put together. Mm. So it was a crown jewel. And the Russians, they wanted a piece of that. And they also craved access to warm waters. If you look at Russia, Russia's geography, they have an immense coastline. It's yeah. all frozen. Yeah. The one port no that is... No beaches in Russia. Yeah. And th there's one port in the Far East, which is Vladivostok, which also is frozen partially part of the year. So, and, and it's ringed fence, ring fenced by the by the Japanese and all, which, are, which is all controlled by the US. So they crave access to the warm waters of the Indian Ocean. And they, the Russians wanted to somehow reach out to India, I mean, you know, get a toehold into, uh, to, into in India's boundaries, and then perhaps uh, take part of India and, you know, reach the, the warm waters. Because that, that, that is the one, one Achilles heel of Russia, that they don't have access to, to warm waters. And that's why they're not able to trade. It eventually led to, led to the demise of the USSR, actually if you look at it from a big picture perspective. Because they were not able to acquire territory that, that would help them. Yeah. I mean, the US had access to all the waters, all the warm waters, the Atlantic, the Pacific, uh, the Indian Ocean, everything. The Russians had access to nothing. Mm. And that is one, one major factor that led to the decline and eventual collapse of the USSR. Other factors also, I'm not saying it's the only factor, but that's one of the factors. So in the, 20, in the 19th century, there was this great game, they called it, being played so out I was in Central Asia. It was not the 90s. 20th, 20th century. 19th century. century yeah. 19th so, and 20th century? So there was a continuation of that, a version of that in the 20th century as well. Okay, it, okay, it kind okay. of still exists. Okay. But yeah, at that They're time... They're still trying? Uh, yeah, well, there's some, always something going on. Mm. So in the 19th century, there was the Russian Empire and the British Empire. Mm. And there was a Crimean War. You know, there's been a war in Crimea recently, mm -hmm. uh, 2014, 20, whatever it was recently. Well, there was a Crimean War in the, nine, in the, eight, in the 1850s, I think, some, somewhere around the 1850s. I don't remember the exact date. The audience can check it out. So there was this great contest for this entire expanse of Central Asia. Whoever will control it can get access to India. And uh, so the British have always sought to deny Russia that. And the reason why the British were so interested in Afghanistan was to hold on to that piece of territory to keep to, to keep the Russians at bay. Because the Russians had made inroads to all the stans, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, mm -hmm. all the stans, which kind of border, which kind of neighbor uh, Afghanistan. They also had some influence in Persia, which is why the British were also very interested in Persia. They wanted to anyhow keep the Russians away from warm waters. Mm. All right. So Persia also, I mean, uh, until the Shah of Iran was ruling, Persia was in British, I mean, Western hands, essentially. It was a Western satellite uh, until the Islamic Revolution in 1979. So the great game was about control of Central Asia. And there was a tremendous struggle going on there behind the scenes. Spies, uh, espionage going on, spies uh, traversing inhospitable territory. I think the Germans even sent a mission to Turkey, via Turkey into India, and they got lost in Afghanistan, something. They, they offended the Afghans by drinking or something, and... That was a, that ended in failure because of that that uh, you know cultural aspect of things, and so on. So the Great Game was is, is fascinating. There was a whole lot of things going on in Tibet as well. There was a, mm -hmm. you know a struggle for the control of Tibet as well. The British sent the young husband expedition into Tibet, I believe, in the early twentieth century or all. So it was all about India actually. 
but the 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 road to india was through central asia for the russians and it was all about denying russia access to india that's what the great gave was all about and right. a version of that continued in the 20th century as well the partition of india was also meant to deny russia access to india because if the whole of india gets independence as in one piece then if india becomes pro ussr it's game over the ussr will get uh, access to india's warm water port, ports so create a, 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 a splinter state of india pakistan which would be permanently in indebted to the west for its creation for its sustenance and that's that's how they can always keep on denying russia access to uh, the arabian sea essentially and uh, there was uranium also involved in that i mean you know aksai chain has uranium mm-hmm. i mean aksai chain is is in chinese hands right now stalin was interested in that aksai chain region and all the chinese were interested so there's there's a lot of competing geopolitical interests behind all these things we think of Paki- the partition and the creation of pakistan as a hindu muslim issue gandhi jinnah there's way more to that gandhi and jinnah were pawns on the chessboard i'm seeing that now one of, one of the things you mentioned in your podcast is geopolitics has no morality there's no morality yeah it's an amoral thing see geopolitics is, is a game of power and power is just a number numbers don't have any morality and in geopolitics what really matters i mean from the perspective of of a nation's leader you have a constituency which is your nation and your mm-hmm. job is to serve them and do the best you can to further the national interest not the national interests of other nations only mm-hmm. yours so you're going to do whatever it takes to further your national interest um two things stem from that one is a little weird because it's just a leap that i'm making now have you been to arambol in goa no i have not have have you noticed that there is a strong concentration of russians in goa i've heard about it yeah so and and some a movie called goa go go goa go gone has also covered the russian mafia in a lot of ways okay um do you think the great game is now being taken place through tourists number one because there's a huge huge concentration of russians living there having businesses there and also having certain control over nightlife there i'm not sure if that can have a geopolitical uh that if if that can influence geopolitics because they are all near warm water why in goa so yeah but they don't have a you know it's it's not just about having a two hole somewhere you need to have a supply chain you need to have a trade a, a route which means a, a railway hmm. or a railroad or some kind of land connection through which you can bring in and, and ferry supplies so just having an outpost somewhere is not going to be enough i see and the second question is okay well we see that the you know russia does not get access to warm water the ussr breaks apart and on 24th february we're going to go into two years of the russia ukraine war uh-huh. right um i have many many questions many many detailed nuances from that but just to sort of start off with at the same time the nato is now beginning a large military exercise with many with many countries given the recent war um nato russia um do you think there is an imminent crisis happening in the future around these two one organization and russia or uh, the crisis is already on so what happened what triggered the the ukraine crisis special military operation whatever you want to call it is the relentless eastward expansion of nato of course right so uh, so nato is a power it's essentially a proxy for the us yeah. it's it's an amalgam treaty, treaty organization right it's a treaty organization and it's essentially controlled by the us so all of these nations they typically have us military bases on their soil they will have us soldiers other soldiers of other nations on their soil and some of these nations even have nuclear warheads american nuclear warheads on their soil and one example is turkey hmm. it's the one of the easternmost uh, members of nato and it kind of sits uh, sits on top of the uh, turkish straits the bosphorus and the dardanelles which is a very important uh, geopolitical uh, choke point so Uh, you have the relentless eastward expansion of nato even though the ussr has broken up nato was created to contain or or to counterbalance the ussr the mm. ussr has broken up but nato continues expanding eastwards now when you say expanding how do we define expanding it's not like the nato which is a treaty of countries can exactly go to ukraine and start taking over so i'll tell you how it expands mm. if you look at uh, the number of nato nations n- members of nato in 1991 you will see an, a certain line on the map that these are the nations mainly western european nations mm. and then uh, post 91 onwards they started adding more members and those were typically members that were former ussr satellite states eastern european so nations so despite the fall of the ussr the yes. nato increases its membership right so they were uh, trying to advance right up to the borders of russia and then what will happen is that the us is way far away across the atlantic but they will have us forces and us proxy forces right on russia's borders mm. which is a tremendous red line 
right? Imagine Russian forces on the Rio Grande border, Texas border. Would the Americans allow that? The USA would like commit suicide. They couldn't. They Go wouldn't ballistic. Be able to believe it. Yeah, they wouldn't believe it. Remember the Cuban Missile Crisis yeah. when Kennedy was was president. Mm. The Russians had placed some nuclear warheads, or missiles on Cuban territory. Which is not even exactly right next to the U.S. I yeah, mean, it's, 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 it's a close island. It's close enough. It's yeah. close enough. And they nearly went to war for this. Yeah. Now, imagine the Americans putting uh, their soldiers, their their warheads, all that, right on Russia's borders. Would the Russians allow it? It obviously doesn't make sense. So that's why the red line was Ukraine. Once the, the, the coup happened in Ukraine, the so-called Maidan, Euromaidan revolution, uh, that's when Putin to, took action and he took over Crimea. And then over a few years, I think he decided that the, the 2022 is the right time to ta- to start uh, taking action in Ukraine itself. So in Ukraine, there is the Do- Luhansk, Donetsk regions where you have uh, ethnic majority, ethnic Russians were the majority. Mm. And they were apparently being uh, oppressed for years. Mm. So Putin goes and takes over all that. And right now there's a slow war going on. The Ukrainian armed forces have been decimated, devastated. Now they're pressing elderly people, elderly men into service. They're even pressing pregnant women into service into the armed forces you'll see that i'm not i'm not kidding check it, check it out pregnant women fighting on the front lines that's what's happening and w- what's and obviously the nato is funding this right yes the nato is funding it's a proxy this. war yes yeah, so so are they also sending in forces no uh, no no they're gonna fight till the last ukrainian is alive and then the war may move somewhere else that's what so ukrainians are leading down laying down their lives yes. for the interests of nato exactly the what skin in the game does nato have beyond losing a country nothing ukraine is a dispo- disposable but, asset i mean uh, is the us not sending forces is this the british not sending forces well they may have sent in some mercenaries or some 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 uh, let's say covert forces w- who would not wear uniforms maybe there's there's been chatter about that but there's no official uniform wearing personnel of either the US or the UK or any other NATO nation on Ukrainian soil. They Officially. must give some funding, some arms, right? That's yes, there's a tremendous amount of arms that's been uh, supplied to Ukraine, maybe more than $50, 50 trillion dollars worth of arms. But the lives lost are Ukrainian. Uh, sorry, not 50 trillion, 50 billion perhaps, or maybe okay. 100 billion. But the lives that are, like you said, the lives that are being lost are Ukrainian lives. Yes. So w- why does someone like uh, Zelensky keep fighting this war then? Is he completely a puppet? Why do the Pakistani generals keep on fighting India? Are they completely pu- puppets? Same thing. See, it's like this. Uh, if you want to to control a nation from by from from far outside away. from far away, what you do is you install a puppet, mm-hmm. you know, and you give that person and their coterie. See, no dictator exists in a vacuum. There's always a bunch of people around him who act uh, as as the enablers, <coughs> who act right. as the power power source, power center, the mm-hmm. inner circle, the outer c- circle, and so on and so forth. That's how it works. That's mm-hmm. how the power works. So typically, what you will have is that this dictator will have certain benefits being given to him or her. Maybe a, t- a tremendously large bank account somewhere in the Swiss bank or in, in the US. And at the end of the day, there's a promise that if everything goes to hell, then you can come back and live in the US and do the lecture circuit. Right. Maybe we will give you the Nobel Prize or whatever. And that's it. And that guy is going to do whatever it takes to, to serve your interests. So he has a ticket back to the US. That's what I expect. Or maybe he's been promised that and maybe it may not happen. I mean, people are expendable at the end of the day. Yeah, I forget. I remember uh, when the Taliban took over Afghanistan, uh-huh. the, we heard about rumors of the, the then president leaving in a jet to somewhere One hears. seeking safe heaven. Yeah. Um, so what about this exercise then? The NATO is beginning a large exercise and uh, w- what's going to be the consequence of this? It's just a saber rattling. It's, it's to keep your uh, troops sharp, uh, keep them active. And keep reminding your 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 adversaries that we are capable of so and so. We have certain capabilities, and ke- so it's all about keeping on uh, keeping on reminding the adversary that we are mm. here. We are capable of so and so things. We have these many troops, and yeah. we, we we exist, and we are there. Like in Hindi, Shakti Pradarshan. Shakti Pradarshan. So yeah. you know, flex off your muscles and all that. You keep on doing that periodically. So this morning, um, Tucker Carlson, formerly of Fox, uh, now exclusively on X, yeah. has reached. Uh, I believe uh, St. Petersburg or Mos- Moscow, he's reached Moscow to interview Vladimir Putin. Mm-hmm. First time an American journalist has gone to uh, sort of break away from national guidelines and interview the head of state of a country that the US is tacitly fighting through the NATO. Um, it's an important junction in the US because he, one of the things he mentioned is that this war is being fought on your taxpayer money, right? So what I want to ask you from here is that what will Putin do? What is going to be his end game? Because is he not sticking the lives of his own 
personnel, his own soldiers, his own country, his own alliances, his own economic resources, all on a war that really has no end. At least as a civilian, I don't see what's the end of it. So the thing is, okay, first of all, Tucker, Tucker Carlson is going to interview Putin or he has interviewed Putin, I'm not sure. He's going to interview him. Okay, yeah, so uh, a couple of years ago, maybe three or four years ago, uh, Oliver Stone interviewed Putin. A series of interviews. He's the an acclaimed filmmaker, right? the filmmaker, yes. Yeah. Uh, the JFK guy. So he had done that. Uh, that was interesting. So yeah, uh, the point is this. See, Putin didn't start the war. Yeah, obviously he launched this special military operation. But he did that when he had no choice. When NATO had uh, reached his, essentially his doorstep. They had uh, in, encroached into Ukraine. And they had uh, you know conducted a coup and uh, placed a puppet into, in, in power. So that was the red line that uh, he could not allow anyone to breach. So that's why he was forced, his hand was forced and he had to do this. And the alternative was you will have NATO forces right at your borders. Yeah. Your for, your soldiers will be face to face, staring eyeball to eyeball with NATO soldiers. And you may have, um, you know, NATO nuclear warheads right across the border. That's something no self-respecting nation can allow. So that's why his hand was forced and that's why he did it. And... Uh, when it comes to the war strategy, he's employing a very defensive, very slow strategy. He's, I mean, he has the means, the ability to to flatten Ukraine in two days' time. He has the firepower, the 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 you know the air force, all of that. He can do that, but he has chosen not to do that. Mm. I mean, you you still have parties going on in Kiev. You have people partying in Kiev as if as if there's no war going on. Really? Yeah. The airspace is locked for commercial flights. I'm sure the airspace is locked for commercial flights. It's uh, no one flies through that except once in a while an Air India plane goes through that. But uh, overall, it's fine. Uh, but yeah, uh, there's there's a very slow war going on. It's a very it's it's a campaign of attrition. Mm. What they're trying to do is to cause as little damage to infrastructure all that as possible. Obviously, some of that is happening. I'm not saying there is no damage to infrastructure. Some of that is going on. Mm. But they're trying to minimize it and they're trying to just suck the Ukrainian armed forces into the mm -hmm. meat grinder like the, like the media likes to call it. Mm -hmm and uh, try it as much of that as possible yeah, so while so having the, as, as little casualties from their side as possible. So loss by exhaustion. Kind of, yeah. I mean, yeah. once the armed forces are depleted, what, what fighting will they do? And, and then NATO will have one of two choices. So give up Ukraine or send their own forces in, which would be a disaster. So when, if they send their forces in, what's going to happen? Then it's going to be an open declaration that these countries are against Russia. No, they, everyone knows they're already against Russia, but it would be a very dangerous line to cross to send NATO forces into a non-NATO nation. Ukraine is not a NATO nation. It's not a member of NATO. And mm. if you send NATO forces into a non-NATO nation to fight Russia, that's going to be a declaration of war and then anything can happen. And then there is obviously the thing that Russia has this doctrine that if any Russian territory is under imminent threat of being lost, then the nuclear option is on the cards then they can, they can use the nuclear option. They can start tactical or whatever, but once you launch a nuke, all bets are off. So nobody wants that. Nobody in their right mind wants to do that. Okay, so last nukes in the world, probably Hiroshima and Nagasaki? I hope so. I hope yeah. it never happens again. So, so Hiroshima and Nagasaki is when we, the world actually saw the last nukes being used, right? Yeah. It's been many, many decades since. I feel like the end point of all wars is, is the threat of nuclear arms, right? At what point does a country actually say, fuck it, let's take up nukes? At what point does it happen? Do you think in our lifetime we're going to see that? And second, have countries become gone very close to pressing the button, hmm. but they've been stopped by yeah. other forces? Yeah. So in the 1960s, in 1969, there was this uh, tremendous border dispute between the USSR and China. Hmm. And there were these border clashes along the Usuri River in the Far East. Okay. It was called the Usuri River incident or clash or whatever you want to call it. Hundreds of soldiers on both sides died. Okay, there was, there was a, almost a full-blown out war. And the Soviets had decided to nuke China. They had decided that. And the Americans caught wind of this. And they threatened the Soviets that if you do this, we're going to nuke you. We're going to come to the rescue of China. And that's what prevented the Soviets from nuking China. But they had decided this. They, they had decided. Ahead. Yes, they had taken the decision. The Americans stepped in, intervened, stopped this from happening. And that led to the US-China detente. And uh, Nixon and Kissinger visited Beijing, met with Mao. And that's where the Chinese started opening up their economy. And that's what created the world that we live in right now. Okay, so the Soviets had decided to nuke China at that point in time. They were really afraid of China because China has this vast ter territory and this tremendously large red army. 
Hmm. Just numbers, sheer numbers. Yeah. And they were worried that, worried that the Chinese would flood their far east with Chinese troops, and then the Russians would lose lose the territory. So they had taken this decision, but the Americans stepped in and stopped this from happening. So that was a point in history where the world came really close to nuclear war. Uh, the other was the Cuban Missile Crisis, where once again you had daggers drawn and nuclear missiles could have been set off at various at at, uh, at the slightest uh, provocation. And there were certain incidents also where people mistook mistook something and thought it's a nuclear missile launch, but say in mines. prevailed and no retaliation was taken and then it, it turned out to be a glitch in the software or whatever the system so there have been uh, you know instances in the past where we have come very close to nuclear disaster now what would make a nation want to or decide to use nuclear weapons is the question so we can take it case by case the, uh, the israelis are an undeclared nuclear power they probably have around 90 or so nuclear warheads okay mm-hmm. and the israelis have a very clear doctrine or whatever what they call the samson option the samson option is that all if all our neighbors if all of israel's neighbors bunch together and decide to invade israel and if israel is on the brink of losing everything then they're going to lo- launch the nukes and destroy everything so we go down but you also all, all go down together that's the samson option so no one survives okay you're going to kill us but we're going to ensure that no no one survives this is a policy that they have for it's crisis. i'm sure i'm sure it's not written somewhere but i it's it's pretty much known that they have the samson option okay. when it comes to this india this is a military maneuver samson like Well, Samson was one of the mythological figures or historical okay, okay, figures. Okay, yes, 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 yes. So he b- brought down the walls of a temple and you know killed see, everyone with himself. That sort of thing. Then when it comes to India, we obviously don't want to use use nuclear weapons ever again, ever not ever again ever, mm. right? But in under what circumstances would you would you possibly imagine that India could use could use nuclear weapons? Uh-huh. I would only imagine that would ha- we would do that if our territorial integrity were under threat and our uh, existence as a nation itself would be threatened. if someone if china and pakistan combine somehow to to attack us from the north and let's say we are on the po- on the verge of being overwhelmed hypothetically mm. hypothetically mm. if we are in the situation like if delhi is overrun for example yeah something like that if if delhi is on the verge of being overrun, overrun and india's armed forces hypothetically are on the verge of being completely overwhelmed in that case i suppose we could use nuclear weapons and then you may destroy us but we're going to ensure nothing of yours also survives the chinese have worked their backsides off for decades to build up whatever they have built we can you know evaporate that if 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 it comes to that so it's it's a it's a lose lose scenario using mm-hmm. nuclear weapons is a lose lose scenario nobody wants to do it so the point of nuclear weapons is deterrence that the adversary knows what your red lines are and they obviously if they are sane they won't try to cross those red lines yeah um so with the like we said So okay let's just say Putin decimates Ukraine and takes it over completely and it, it, it reincorporates it as a part of Russia let's just say uh-huh. what's the end game then where does Putin march from there does he stop the war sign a treaty uh, you know get some get some punishments from the west because you know in the <laughs> international court of justice uh, south africa has condemned israel yeah israel israel look i i uh, so what is putin's end game is a good question Uh, I don't think he wants to decimate and flatten Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's no point capturing a country that has been flattened and yeah. there's nothing left, because there's, then you have to rebuild the whole country with, using, using your own economy, mm-hmm. your own manpower, manpower. For example, if if China were to take Taiwan, but it would just take a f- smashed out, f- smoldering ruin of a country, what what's what is go- what is it going to gain? Mm-hmm. It won't gain anything, actually, beyond a piece of real estate. So I think Putin's end game is to ensure that Ukraine becomes permanently neutral. He will obviously reincorporate some territories like the Luhansk, Donetsk regions. Perhaps even march on to Kiev and maybe do a regime change there. Put a puppet president over there who will like be like he used to be back in the day. Maybe like that. Yeah. So Ukraine historically is Slavic territory, Russian territory. Ukraine means the borderlands. Borderlands of what exactly? Borderlands of Russia. What else? So historically, it's been Russian. I mean, Slavic. the slavic uh, people are are they speak a bunch of slavic languages mm-hmm. and the major language is russia R- russian serbian is also a slavic language and so on so uh, i think the end game is to ensure that ukraine becomes permanently neutral some parts of ukraine will be reincorporated or have already been re- reincorporated to russia maybe there will be a partition of ukraine east and west maybe kiev becomes neutral and there's a puppet president who is pro russia over there and maybe the western part of ukraine could go and reintegrate with whatever nations are to the west of ukraine because historically and retreats sorry and nato retreats or nato will have to retreat and is going to ensure that by force hmm not through a treaty treaties can be broken but force is 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 real 
How, I mean, it's going to sound very simplistic. How is it that a treaty becomes an organization? I was looking at the full form of NATO. It says National North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Okay, so look, a treaty is just a piece of paper. Okay, it's a charter, and uh, there are so it's a military alliance essentially. You can give it whatever name you want. You can call it mm. organization, treaty organization. You can call it an alliance, whatever. It's a military alliance, and the whole uh, fundamental. Uh, underpinning of that is that it was created to counterbalance the USSR which was rising very rapidly which was a major power and it brought all the nations of western europe together into one alliance with the us as the big daddy as the big is the big partner and the fundamental un- underpinning was that an attack on any of these nations was to be regarded as an attack on all other nations and if you attack one of the nations everybody else will respond collectively together mm-hmm. so that brings all the nations under a single block it kind of pools the military sovereignty etc under one single command so all these nations that are part of nato are under a s- centralized nato command okay and technically it's all like you know you have sovereign you retain sovereignty but you give your some portion of your armed forces under this command and so on but actually at the end of the day the most powerful nation controls the alliance yeah which is the us so nato is an organization it's also an org- so the the foundation of the organization is the treaty which they signed whenever it was the organization was founded yeah. so it's an alliance they can give it whatever name they want treaty ally organization or whatever but it's a military alliance controlled by the us that's what it is got it um there is talk now from from pretty much uh, many news outlets here in the country um about india's rise as a global superpower a superpower not really but like as we are now in the midst of an india story right our eam seems to believe it our prime minister seems to champion it indians overall in the country are feeling this upsurge of positivity this upsurge of uh, pride about who they are and uh, they are no longer seeking as much validation from the west at least that's what i've come to believe through reading stuff and being speaking to people i was i uh, met up with a former cnn employee at a bar because he was friends with a friend of mine and i said what does the us media show about india so he says when they cover the international news they mostly cover wars they don't cover india we don't like the prime minister because of these and these reasons um and i thought to myself are we really being fed a, a great india story through our own news outlets and through all pro india outlets but actually geopolitically we're not scaling up so india is not a superpower let's be very clear about that and i don't think either the the foreign minister or the prime minister have ever said that india is a superpower of or course. an aspiring superpower yeah okay i don't think they've ever said no it, not superpower i mean like the the india on the rise story yeah it's yeah, yeah that is definitely there yeah. so le- if you look at the statistics if you look at the data yes it, India's GDP is rising. It's it's the fastest rising large economy in the world. It's the only economy that doesn't have any chance of recession next coming few years. Uh, as the economic uh, strength grows, so does the military muscle. It's a it's a proportionate factor, right? And India's uh, power projection abilities are expanding. India is conducting uh, you know uh, maritime operations all the way to the Gulf of uh, uh, Bab al Mandeb, the the near the Red Sea. between the the gulf of aden and the red sea the where the piracy is happening mm-hmm. in the east coast of africa we are you know apprehending pirates and and uh, saving various ships and vessels we doing that uh, we are part of various uh, multilateral organizations like the quad like the i2u2 and so on so forth we we have uh, brought africa the african union into g20 which is now g21 mm-hmm. so we can see that the relevance of india globally is rising as india's economy grows and as the world gets you know tries to move away from china because of a multiple multitude of reasons now it's a china plus 1 that's this uh, that's a policy every nation has so then they are looking at india what's As the policy china plus 1 what does that mean china plus 1 is that uh, means that uh, see all the nation all the major western nations right now use china as the manufacturing base right mm. because uh, you know it was very it's cheap it's a factory of the world the the world's factory and all that but now the 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 cost of manufacturing in china is rising and the chinese government is clamping down on a lot of things and there is the um, added dimension of uh, trade sanctions and trade barriers and all that the chips act and all that so they want to move away from china and 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 invest in a different country which is more closely aligned to the west or at least not openly hostile to the west hmm. so india is the natural uh, you know um, uh, place where you would go to because it has a massive uh, population a massive uh, p- potential for manufacturing and all that so there is that india's economy is rising and india's uh, geopolitical footprint is rising india's uh, you could say a military footprint is rising so if you look at all of these factors put together and if you were to 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 
plot a graph of india's overall power it's definitely rising hmm. so india is definitely a, a power that's rising uh, by 2030 it will probably be number 3 in terms of overall power globally after after the us and china but india is right now not a match for china the only uh, unfair advantage we have is that we have nuclear weapons which kind of keeps china at bay if we did not have nuclear weapons china would very much want to fragment india and do whatever it takes to fragment india so uh, india currently is not a match in terms of raw power even for china india is a regional power a growing regional power give it 20 years we will be a match for anybody in the world but it's going to take time so we are a nation on the rise we are nowhere close to being a superpower we mm. are not even close to being a challenge to china right now mm. but we are a long term threat to everybody if they want to th- think in terms of threats so th- india is not a hegemonic power india is not an expansionist power the fact that india is con- conducting naval maritime operations military operations in the gulf region in the mid- middle east region it is a- actually something that has greatly enthused the middle eastern countries like the uae saudi arabia etc because they know that we're not going to go and you know invade them ne- next yeah. week yeah. but it's it's also uh, something that that gives them some kind of cover because until now it was only the us that had a naval, naval hegemony in the region yeah. now we have the rise of india india is a friendly nation to all these all these uh, middle eastern countries and it's it's kind of a counterbalance so so why are we not expansionist is it like what has prevented us from being expansionist look like- yeah i'll tell you why if you start being expansionist then you're going to start wars you're going to get embroiled in military conflicts here and there and wherever and when you get embroiled in military conflicts you a lot of your resources go into that Mm. and you want to use those resources to build up your manufacturing build up your eco- eco- economy become and a, then maybe fight for in 100 years so let's years. become a 30 trillion dollar economy fir sochenge then we'll think of i'm not saying we should do that yeah. but yeah let's let's first you know first cover the basics then we can think of everything else and it's not like we want to fight the world why should we we just want to have a stable peaceful neighborhood and and uh, live our, way, our our life the way we like to live it without others telling us what to do or interfering in our internal affairs so why are we not a threat to china beyond the nukes like like is our manufacturing not at that level do we not have the same bilateral relations with other countries or perhaps our military power is when we do the comparison between the two we're astoundingly at a low number so there's a number of factors first of all we are what a 4 trillion dollar economy okay the chinese are 17 or something 17 point something trillion dollars yeah. okay so they are more than four times as large as india almost five times as large as india economically the gdp okay gross national gross domestic product then if you look at the chinese military budget what is it it's about 270 300 billion dollars roughly okay give or take i'm not sure what the exact figure is mm-hmm. it's 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 a multiple of what india spends india spends maybe 80 billion dollars maybe maybe let's say 100 and the chinese spend 300 billion So mm. that's a factor of three or four right there. So if you look at the amount of resources they're, they're spending in, uh, spe- you know, investing in military development, it's way more than India. Their economy is way larger than India. Ah, uh, their the size of the nation, the population, the population is the more or less the same, comparable. The size is so much bigger. They have so much more resources at their disposal because of the of the size, and uh, yeah, these are the factors. Uh, when it comes to power projection, India is kind of on par with uh, with China. Okay, and when when it comes to uh, the the international order and the and the way india is regarded and china is regarded people other nations kind of regard china as a threat okay mm. they respect the chi- the fact that china is so powerful so big economically and so on but they see china as a threat and they see china as a nation that wants to exploit them in some way or the other mm. so wherever, and, and it's got the evidence of that there is evidence of that they have you know use all this all this debt trap uh, debt trap diplomacy with various nations for example the hamban tota port in in sri lanka they finance that port that port is completely unviable nobody uses it but now the because the sri lankan government was not able to repay the loan the chinese have acquired that land on a 99 year lease so they have acquired a piece of a sri lankan sovereignty I see, I see. and the same story exists in various parts of africa and all that so the chinese have this this you know this predatory policy of of uh, giving uh, loans that cannot be repaid you know and then you you take over some part of the nation's sovereignty and territory wow so they act like a vicious loan shark and then they take over like a loan shark exactly yeah Yeah. I see. And they also do lots of uh, cyber warfare, no? Big. They're quite good at that. Yeah. yeah. They've been they've been very vocal also about that that we can do this and that. And yeah. I actually had a roommate in college um a housemate in college rather. Uh-huh. And he was working with this uh US think tank on their radio program uh-huh. and preparing programming for understanding US and China relations. And I think he got into deep rather too deep. Okay. 
and we were sitting on the porch on our porch in Boston um, on one random afternoon and a message popped up on his screen some random Chinese alphabets the screen turned black he said you've been hacked and some joking emoticons came around and his laptop was dead after that mm-hmm. so and after that he completely stopped ex- uh, in investigating China this was in, <laughs> this, was in uh, this was in the summer of 2018 I see many many years but that one incident mm-hmm. proved to me um, also about just the just the number of Chinese people who live in the US oh yes as you know they come in as international students mm-hmm. or they come in as uh, uh, you know unsuspecting migrants um, and and some he told me that most some of these people are actually like agents of the Chinese government to understand how the US works how the society works they've been embedded there deliberately and g- been given tons of cash yeah that's that's pretty strategic actually if you look at the the if you look at chinese students who come to the us uh, and uh, you would say that they are very strategic in the kind of departments they go into they'll go into departments related to various technologies you know mm-hmm. niche technologies important technologies and they'll try and get into pa- positions of power and influence within these departments not just as students but they'll become faculty they'll rise into the into yes. positions of power and you will see chinese uh, origin professors everywhere in all these technology departments and all that and uh, some of them have been accused and actually apprehended uh, because they have been uh, you know stealing technology and transmitting that to to back to the mainland motherland mm-hmm. whatever that it is and uh, chinese business people have uh, have taken over lots of real estate and stuff like that so there's a there's a concerted effort by the chinese to to infiltrate various nations whether it's the us or canada or wherever you have sensitive sensitive technologies even australia they have done that you know and uh, they they use various kinds of techniques sometimes they bully the, the australian politicians and, and government in cer- certain ways uh they they have been caught trying to honey trap various us senators and politicians mm. that sort of thing as well and they also have these tremendous cyber capabilities so in the early 2000s there was this uh, this series of coordinated cyber attacks from china into the us uh, the americans called it titan rain t i t a n titan rain and the chinese extracted tremendous amounts of very sensitive military blueprints and information of fighter plane uh, blueprints etc which the uh, i think the f22 or f35 or whatever it was and the chinese now have a fighter plane that looks very much like that mm. and and much more so the chinese have uh, tried all kinds of measures and they have been extremely successful at at various levels and like you said they have infiltrated the us at various uh, levels and things like that and of course yeah if you are if you are digging too deep into china they may actually hack your devices and send you a warning a friendly warning get you get yourself a new laptop and don't try this again hmm. is that why the the indian government bans so many chinese apps because yeah. that's in fact that is something that is lauded very well by other countries when they talk about india that's right so we uh, our government has banned a whole bunch of apps in in several tranches at the first go it was more than 80 apps and then there were like two or three more uh you know sessions of banning a bunch of chinese apps mm-hmm. so what the chinese apps do is that they they essentially you know leech out all your information all your personal data and they they keep on sending this data back to their home server mother mother server on a routine basis so they know exactly where you are going and whatever your your movements are like mm-hmm. and what your preferences are and obviously that that helps them create a certain kind of demographic uh, footprint and 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 kind of a demographic map of the people of india those of uh, those who are using uh, chinese technology you know whatever chinese cell phones exist uh, and uh, even if you're using an apple phone for example if you have chinese apps then you may be they may be able to steal your information and keep tabs on you and all that of course if you use an apple phone or america uh, you know android phones the, the americans may be able to do the same thing for of course it. yeah so it works in both ways yeah but we always see the because of the great pr that the west has done we oh, always yeah. see the west as less nefarious than china yes that's right um from there i've also noticed that uh, was, uh that you know in the uk as well and especially in student governments and in, in colleges uh pakistan also sends its uh, students or its elites to get study to mm-hmm. study there and then rise to prominent positions of power yes is that also a way to sort of influence uk society and make sure that uh, indians they counteract indians there in the intellectual sphere so this is something that is d- being done probably at the behest of the uk uk government even canada and really? so i'll tell you what so the uk has always been very pro pakistan and very anti india it's always been part of the history because they created pakistan as a counterbalance to india and this is despite the fact that there are more uk india bilateral talks events sim- summits happening all the time doesn't matter they prefer pakistan so what they do is that they 
place Pakistani uh, students in prominent positions, give them a, a prominent voice, and uh, you you get you see this all the time. You know, uh, Pakistani origin students rising to positions of power as student leaders. Yes. And things like that. You will see that all the time, yeah, yeah, especially yeah. in the UK. Okay, so you will, you will see them in all the big universities, Oxford, Cambridge, all that. Uh, student leaders or a student president or whatever they call it. You know, that, that uh-huh. sort of thing. Uh, so that's something I probably believe is being done by the US go by the UK government. It's it's a it's it's a well thought out strategy to kind of marginalize Indians, make them less visible, make their voice not um, marginalize their voice, and bring the Pakistani voice to the fore, so as to construct various kinds of narratives and, and you know about India and about Pakistan. That Pakistan is the victim. Pakistan is on the is is justified in whatever yeah. f- things because, it's fighting for and all because that. Because the think tank uh, class, hmm. you know, gets their education in the UK. So then they can also import that back to their own country, and yes. then that allows them to then at least have one more outpost to to shape global narratives about Pakistan. It also allows them to identify potential future collaborators from the Indian student pool, those mm-hmm. who are not fighting back, pushing back against that, but actually collaborating and going ahead, going going along with with the narrative that's been constructed. Yeah, so it's a great uh, feeder ground, no? No, but like in in that way, an Indian student listening to a Pakistani speaking about Pakistan's influence. Uh, from a point of curiosity, could also be cooperated in this. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and and it's like if you don't uh, go along with the mainstream narrative, you're gonna be marginalized. But if you want to, if you are ambitious, if you want to rise to positions of power and prominence, you may as well along as well as uh, play along with that. Mm-hmm. Some people will will put aside their national interests and their allegiance to the nation and go and play play along with this. And you have so many such people that mm-hmm. that are part of the think tank circles and all in the West, especially who are Indians, but they write all kinds of anti-India articles and stuff like that. You know, mm-hmm. propaganda contribute to the propaganda. Yeah. I, I wonder what kind of person would it be to start doing anti-India activities abroad? Like, is it just money? Is it the? I'll tell you what it is. What? It, it, to some extent, it's money, but more than that, it's prestige. So prestige from the enemy, prestige from the West, not from Pakistan. Who cares about Pakistan prestige? Prestige in the West. You are in a prominent position in in a prominent university in the West. Maybe in Sweden, maybe in Norway, maybe in the UK, maybe in Canada, maybe in the US. You get invited to all these major conferences, and you are given a position of honor in in these conferences. And uh, you travel business class, and you are part of the limousine and champagne circuit. I mean, what else? What is there not to like about that? Don't you think? <laughs> I, I, I never and, and thought, you, you're yeah. quoted by the BBC, by the CNN. Yeah, as you're a everywhere. legitimate expert on yes. all things South Asian and Indian, of course. Yes, yes, absolutely. Of course, that's there. Which reminds me, uh, you know, something that you t- retweeted from this man called Subhash Kak. I just I was looking at your Twitter, I figured it would be nice to bring it up. Especially on the context of students. <clears throat> now, he said, It is dangerous to wholesale introduce Western liberal arts programs into India without critical analysis. Adapt only what is good and true and reject what is bad and wrong. This is because the universalism of the liberal view is a thinly disguised successor to attitudes of European imperialism and racism. That's right. So when it comes to the humanities, when it comes to the liberal arts, it's all about narratives and propaganda. So the, in the in the West, the but view all of it is there no saving grace in the humanities here in India? In India, what humanities do we have? We have uh, departments of humanities that uh, well, if you look, let's talk about the Indian humanities departments. Go to the website of whatever university you would like. Okay, uh, for example, take one of the IITs. These mm. days, you know, even the IITs have humanities departments, sociology, yeah, which and is a hard science. Typically, yeah. Indian Institute of Technology, and they are giving master's degrees in sociology and history, and God knows what else. I, I wonder why. I mean, that's that's money that's being allocated to science and it's being used for this. Anyway, yeah. so go to one of these departments online, okay, check out the faculty and check out the research interests and what they're publishing. What what are the topics that they are publishing about? And you will typically find it's about, uh, you know, caste atrocities, caste oppression, uh, majoritarian oppression in India. It's all about creating a, atrocity literature and atrocity narratives about India and portraying India as a nation that, that is... Uh, inegalitarian oppressive uh, and uh, and uh, majoritarian or or brahminical or mm-hmm. patriarchal or misogynistic or backward and all that it's all about creating those narratives that's all they publish all of these so called in you know professors and all that who have phd's and who are who are guiding phd students in all these uh, humanities departments that's all they are doing i mean india is a gold mine for sociology there are so many 
aspects of india that are fascinating so much culture so much yeah. history so many traditions what are the, what are the sim, what is the symbol uh, you know the meaning of various traditions what is it uh, what are the historical roots of that uh, what is the purpose of a certain ritual tradition or custom or whatever yeah. and, and there's so much in that you know you can bring in intersectionality of, of history and invasions and what not you can bring out uh, whatever in, in that india is fascinating from that perspective i mean take a simple small state like for example jharkhand take a state like assam Take a state like uh, any any far eastern, north eastern state. There is so much to explore in that from a sociological perspective. Mm-hmm. But all they want to do is explore the oppression narrative. That's all they do. Yeah. So when it comes to India's humanities departments, all they do is they create atrocity literature and atrocity narratives, which is then used by the West to justify what they want, the the kind of narratives they are creating about India. Now, when it comes to the Western humanities departments, you will see, uh, for example, you have all this open courseware on YouTube. Mm-hmm. right you can see all their lectures all the all their courses whatever it is yeah so they will have uh, you know masters degree or bachelor's degree level courses on various religions world religions mm-hmm. so when it comes to um, a course on islam you will have a person who is a muslim who is a professor who's going to teach the students about islam okay it's going to be very respectful they're going to go deep into uh, whatever islam is judaism you're going to have a jewish person who will do that Okay, when it comes to Christianity, whatever, it's going to be a Christian person. When it comes to Hinduism, it's always going to be a Western white person who's going to teach the students about Hinduism, yeah. and you will see that the tone is very different. It's not respectful. It's kind of mocking. So that's the attitude and and the and the perspective from which they they approach our uh, you know culture. So what do you expect? So what Dr. Subhash Kak is saying is very, very absolutely right. So if they if, if you're going to bring in U.S. universities or Western universities into India, they're going to continue doing the same thing over here, and it's going to give them more access to Indian students, very easily manipulate, you know, uh, influenceable Indian students who are yeah. who are open to uh, suggestion and all that. It's going to be very easy to to influence them and and and, and make them, you know, and and. Uh, condition their way of thinking and their way of looking at their own culture so it's obviously a very dangerous thing secondly when it comes to the us when it comes to the west the entire uh, humanities and liberal arts ecosystem academic ecosystem has been taken over by what they call the message the woke agenda we know that it's been taken over by the, by the leftists it's a phenomenon that started in the 1950s and 60s and now it's it's widespread it's yeah. pervasive you bring it you bring that in it's going to create more trouble in india I mean, I mean, we don't need to wholesale swallow whatever they are they are peddling. So it's a very legitimate concern that Dr. Kark has raised over here, and it's something that the U that the Indian government has to should take very seriously. Uh, we have op- we are in the process of, of opening our doors to Western universities to open campuses in India mm-hmm. and give their degrees on on Indi- through Indian campuses. But uh, when it, uh, I think we should be selective in what we allow them to do. We definitely want uh, better educational opportunities when it comes to science and technology. Yeah, we we don't we do want that. But why do we need to learn their philosophy and their worldview when it comes to the the fine arts? Don't we have fine arts and, and all that of our own? Don't we have our sure. own uh, philosophical systems that we should teach our uh, students and maybe export worldwide? Why don't we do that instead of uh, you know taking that over here? Yeah, usually when people, I remember going to philosophy classes in college, and mm-hmm. one was to learn for the Western philosophy. That yes. was the, but then philosophy classes in college that had Eastern philosophy had to be labeled as Eastern philosophy. Oh yeah. The rest was just philosophy. Universal. Yeah, universal. So the Western value values and we have Western philosophies are universal. Yeah. Everything else is specific. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it has to be labeled African philosophy or yes. Eastern philosophy for that matter. Yeah, I, I guess you're right because you know I've I've had uh, friends in uh, here in the north. Ashoka University and General Global Law University, two mm-hmm. very coveted in universities in the country. Um, what I found in his many cases, they often import community college trash to come in as legitimate professors <laughs> that would never even dream of getting into a lowly state school in the U.S. Mm-hmm. But here in our formidable universities, they teach full-fledged courses. And sadly, because we often assume. कि गोरा बोल रहा है ठीक बोल रहा होगा तो नो प्रॉब्लम दैट दैट मेंटल कंडीशनिंग इज स्टिल वेरी मच अलाइव इन इंडिया द द द the the idea that if you have white skin if if you are from the west and if you speak, speak with a certain accent you are automatically superior mm-hmm. and you automatically know everything and yeah. what you say has to be the gospel truth so you bring in all these uh, substandard individuals and you you 
position them as professors and and scholars and experts in in India, and all these students are like, yes sir, yes sir, you must be right, and that's that's how you brainwash entire generations of of students, yeah. and it's 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 really unfortunate that the so-called uh, top universities in India are are following this trend, and uh, yeah, something has to be done about this. Yeah, and um, standards have to be raised. Yeah, also like. I've just noticed from a very informal standpoint in many interactions when when uh, koi, someone white comes in, yeah, someone from America, mm -hmm. you know, it has to be the the best white, ah. you know, uh, the most prestigious white. I've seen many times uh, acquaintances of mine will um, direct all conversations to appeal to the American, mm -hmm. and the American will have a very bored, plain look, mm -hmm. uh, as if like nothing really satisfies him or her, and then sometimes takes him apart, and all of these people are then fawning over him i'm not saying this is all indians i'm not saying this is all americans but generally i've seen that what i would like to see now from indians is that considering our country is rising in all these factors we also start taking accountability in social situations and not letting everything not explaining everything to the american and american words but having the other person come on and say what do you mean by that i think we've been explaining ourselves away too much and watering ourselves down too much to the rest of the world because we want to be accepted and seen and be looked at in a kind and pitiful manner by the West so that we get their funding or their validation. But I say no more to that. I say we should flip the script now. I totally agree. We in India, lots of us still have are conditioned to seek validation from from the Westerners, from the white people, especially Americans, the, the best white person, like you said. Hmm. And, and the reason for that is is pretty simple, actually. If you if you take a, an average Chinese person and an average Indian person, the Chinese typically won't seek validation from the Westerner. Hmm. The Indian will. And what's the reason for this? There has to be a simple root cause. And the simple root cause is that the quality of your demographics, the quality of your individuals is directly proportional to the quality of your education system and what is taught right. in there. So in China, they have a very good education system. They've they've invested trillions of dollars worth of money in the past three or four decades into the Chinese education system. They have uh, inculcated a sense of pride and and identity in among the Chinese that we are a civilization in our own right. We have our, our own values. We have our own way of doing things. And the West is not necessarily the best. And the West have oppressed us. And we're going to fight back. And we're not going to portray ourselves as victims. This is taught to Chinese kids. It is to Chinese kids. The century of humiliation. That's what taught to every single Chinese kid. It's called the century of, centuries of humiliation? The century of humiliation. The opium wars and all that. The 19th century and all the way up to the second world war. Okay. Yeah, all okay. that. So that's the century of humiliation and the Chinese students, they ensure that they are aware of this. They are aware that the West has done, has historically done this to us and they are made aware that we are a civilization in our own right. We are superior to the West is what they are taught and so on. Really? Yeah. We've never been taught we're superior. We have never been taught about We've the been... existence of India as a civilization in its own right. Yeah. That is itself is, is non-existent. We don't know what India is. Is India a piece of geography? Is India a nation, a kingdom? Is it something that was created in 1947? What is India? We don't even teach our kids what is India? Hum log kone, who are we? Who are the Indian people? Nothing is taught. We don't have a sense of identity. We don't we don't have a sense of pride in ourselves. So that's why we automatically seek validation from whoever is portrayed as goody goody in Hollywood. And that's how it goes. So it's all about the education system. Reform it. The education system is trash. Absolute trash. And whatever, what new education policy or whatever, it's like putting a band-aid on a gunshot wound. We have to totally yeah. revamp the education system. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, on that note, I think um, there is much to be done. When, when I saw many of my friends talking about India as a civilizational state, I would never understand it. Because I did not know what it meant in the first place. I just figured, okay, well... Now what's happening is the right has found a new thing to say, okay, I mean, India is in a civilizational state, so let's keep talking about that. But I've never explored this education angle, right? Like I never knew that, that China is told actively that we're superior to the West. I can never imagine in my entire life any teacher of mine, not to their fault, telling us that we're superior. Yeah. We are always taught this, okay, we were a colony, we, had, we were the crown jewel of the empire, we were, you know, marginalized and and uh, you know we were basically slaves to the empire in a lot of ways and now we're on the come up but the come up to where the come up to some pride the come up to mere existence the idea that we can be the best and we are the best i think this idea will take multiple iterations in education and multiple people talking about it yeah, yeah. it'll take time but we have to start somewhere. We have to understand what our past is because without a past, you don't have a future. Mm. So what do we aspire to be? That's the question. Do we aspire to be okay? Do we aspire to be average? Maybe slightly better than average? 
do we aspire to be the best i mean what do we aspire to be what standards do we hold ourselves to yeah. right now i see that the standards of the average indian are very low i'm not saying that i am the best and everyone rise up to my standards of course, of course. i'm saying everybody has to rise to the fullest extent of their potential to the mm-hmm. maximum to the maximum extent of their own potential first discover what your potential is and then try to live up to whatever you can as best as you can and if everyone starts raising their standards in that manner india will be transformed but to un- to do that we have to first understand what we were in the past i mean we are taught the past 1000 years of history which is all disaster after disaster but what was there before that we never taught that i mean we we accounted for more than 33% of the entire world's gdp we had golden ages we had empires that uh, encompassed uh, enormous territories including Xinjiang, jang and parts of central asia and afghanistan gandhar was part of india we are never taught any of this so we need to be taught our true history first of all so that we understand where we are coming from mm. and where we are today now ask yourself why we were there and now we are here what happened in in the in in, in the interim mm. and what can we do to kind of try to reclaim what we once were i'm not saying go and expand and conquer all territories but okay. try and be better than what we are today yeah power doesn't have to be territorial expansion alone exactly it can also be the expansion of the minds of people living inside the territories um you know in one of the th- one of your podcasts you talked about artificial states versus civilizational states mm-hmm. right i found that very fascinating mm-hmm. so you said that russia china and india are civilizational states yes and america is a fake artificial state so <laughs> so is canada that 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 grouping is is very like polarizing or i would say like might me many might consider it offensive sure but i would help i would love your help to understand what is a civilizational state exactly okay so what's a civilization as compared to a nation so currently we 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 have this paradigm the westphalian model the westphalian paradigm in which every political sovereign unit is a nation state hmm. but when it comes to the past we didn't have nation states we had kingdoms we had empires and we had civilizations and we, when we had vassal states and all that hmm. so a civilization is an entity which is a large entity which lasts a long time and which has certain traits in common it has a single unifying culture mm-hmm. which may have local manifestations which look different but overall it's a sing- singular culture with a sing- with a with a common and uniform set of values okay that's one thing historic S- examples india India. Okay, if you look at Mesopotamia, 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 it's a certain point. Egypt, for example, Egypt yeah. was one civ- civilization. Okay, uh, e- Greece was a civilization. China is a civilization. Russia, you can say, is a civilization. So one large geographical area, which kind of could encompass multiple sovereign nations, multiple sovereign states or kingdoms, but mm-hmm. it has just the single culture, a single culture. It also has a single unifying civilizational language. which peop which not everybody may speak but when you interact with people from other places of the, of the they kind of understand they kind of uh, talk to each other in that civilizational language in india it was sanskrit hmm. even the chinese when they would come to india they would converse in sanskrit and so on so in india we had that and a civilization is historically a net exporter of culture hmm. not an importer of culture it has cultural influence beyond its borders so look at india's historical influence all of china was indianized at uh, over the past 2000 years the chinese kings used to fight each other they used to go to war for the possession of an indian scholar kumara jiva is a great example chinese kings went to war so that they could have kumara jiva in their court and and that indian culture which went into china was eventually transmitted to japan so the chinese called something chan which was dhyan the, it went to japan they call it zen zen is also dhyan Okay so much of the japanese culture is founded on a bedrock of indian culture okay it's it's a, visible in their art it's, it's very visible, visible yeah. yeah their gods goddesses benjaitin uh, kangiten all indian gods and goddesses all the indian gods and goddesses hindu gods and goddesses are part of japanese buddhism mm-hmm. and you see that in china as well and uh, southeast asia suvarna bhumi thousands of years indianized completely the high point of indonesian uh, civilization history was the majapahit empire which was a hindu empire and the indonesian still you know uh, hold that as the high point of their of their history so indian civilization spread far and wide it was a single unifying culture but different languages mm-hmm. but when you met people from various parts of this uh, the entire uh, geography you would speak to each other in sanskrit okay so that's how it was so india was a net exporter of culture uh even greece greece was a net exporter of culture the romans absorbed greece greek culture wholesale right egypt was also a net exporter of culture so these are some certain characteristics that are inherent to civilizations as opposed to nations so only a few entities historically can claim to be civilization states mm. mesopotamia came and went it's gone egypt came and went it's gone greek civilization is dead by the way it doesn't mm. exist anymore a uh, slavic civilization kind of exists in the form of russia chinese civilization kind of exists in the form of the chinese communist party run empire and indian civilization kind of hobbles along under the secular state hmm. 
so that's where we are today so and when, when it comes to artificial nations that's another distinction right that's the controversial part that people will not like when it when it comes to the us the us look at that geography that territory where what was it like 500 years ago who lived there the natives <coughs> right the native americans they lived their own life over there in their own way then you had the european invasions and then you had settler colonialism mm -hmm. so these people they brought mil hundreds of thousands of europeans onto this territory they settled the territory they they elbowed the natives out wholesale massacre at least 56 million natives died native americans okay that's not me saying you check out yeah. the published articles so what was done was a population replacement event and whatever was left of the native american population was relegated to those uh, uh, reservations them? reservations mm. and they said that we have given them land of their own and they can live almost sovereign lives there go and see the conditions there is do they have access to electricity sanitation plumbing yeah. water are they allowed to come out of the reservations getting off the reservation is is a is a is it's a, a whole trope is a euphemism is a trope yeah, yeah, yeah. right don't get off the reservation stay stay on reservation that sort mm -hmm. of thing so they have relegated marginalized these people to the status of second class third class citizens and the entire nation the us has been created artificially out of stolen territory set to settler colonialism the mm -hmm. same goes for canada the same goes for lots of nations in uh, latin america so mm -hmm. these are artificially created nations uh, with a bunch of oh, immigrants right. would you say most of latin america is just spanish settlers yes Spanish, Europe Italian. Spanish. Look at Argentina. Most of them are of Italian origin. Strangely enough, even though they speak speak Spanish. Check out oh. the check out the history. Messi is a Italian surname. You see, <laughs> so many of the people who uh, live in Argentina today are descendants of Italian settlers. Mm. Okay, but overall the dominant language is Spanish. Spanish yeah. So all of these nations were created artificially through immigration from Europe, and typically you had a bunch of immigrants coming from various parts of Europe. So there is no single ethnicity, there's no single language. Obviously, the language in the U.S. the dominant language is the language of the Anglo-Saxons, who were the major colonizers. So it's English. So these are artificially created nations. There is no actual rooting in the ground in the soil. It's just a resource to be exploited, and that's that's how they use the land today. You know, just. Ever, ever, ever increasing expansion westwards, and then they reach the Pacific Ocean. Now, what do we do? Now we dig and frack, and uh, churn out the oil and pollute the water and all that, and uh, that's how it is. And then we move on to Mars and nuke Mars, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just blown away by this this definition because, wow, like I'm, I'm not even taking these countries seriously anymore <laughs> because of what you mentioned. No, you got to take them seriously because they are so powerful. they are a real force they are the dominant force in the world today that's the yeah. fact of life so you got to respect that you got to respect power but this is the truth hmm i mean this is this is an undeniable historical facts awesome so like always i want to say um thank you for your time thank uh, you for having me uh and uh, you are perhaps the single most available reservoir of all this information in one person in the country right now and thank you for broadcasting your thoughts about all of these things the rest of the country and the world and um i'm just glad to have you as a friend and as someone who speaks about these things because i had a lot of themes i wanted to cover today and you offered insights in the 3x what i was expecting so thank you um i'm going to get your course this is not like we didn't discuss ki hum course ko karenge mostly because on the way here i was uh, uh listen to your podcast again and again and and i really like how you mentioned the civilization state and the fake states and vassal states and all these other things because it helps cement the current standings of countries uh, very well you know from a historical standpoint so overall thank you so much for your time and thank you for having me here thank you for having me on the on the podcast thank you so much